Welcome to Jim and Ed's Weekly Shoot. I'm Jim Rugg. My name is Ed Piscor. Can I break kayfabe off the bat? Go for it. <laughs> you can do anything you want, Ed. <laughs> I have to wear these sunglasses because I feel like a fucking douchebag staring into the camera lens. And we recently shot that episode um, that should air in about four weeks from this record about um, Katsuhiro Otomo's work. And I'm playing host there. I just can't fucking look in the camera. So if I wear my shades, you don't know that I'm not looking at you. Or at least that's, that's sort of what I'm telling myself. I just feel way more fucking comfortable. So I apologize if I look douchey, but I felt like I looked way more douchey uh, darting my eyes around last time. I have the same problem, but no sunglasses. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see how it goes. You'd look good with some aviators on, man. Next week. So what is this? We've been getting a lot of questions from the kayfabers by way of direct message on social media, emails, and, and in the comment section. We could use this space to address some of those questions. Uh, we could use this space to talk directly to the kayfabers out there. One thing I want to do is thank everybody who participated in sending in their uh, kayfabe fake uh, Wizard Magazine cover art. Uh, I think some people are mistaken in thinking that it's a, uh, it's like a sort of contest or, or something. They, they put these posts up with these beautiful covers asking if it's too late. <laughs> it's never too late. Like keep sending them in, man. Those things are awesome. And, and uh, you know, tag us. Don't just at Cartoonist Cafe because it'll get lost in the shuffle when, when we get a bunch of likes. Like, you know how Instagram kind of ages, off. Like, you could see a hundred posts. <clears throat> so it'll age off. Uh, tag us and and you know on our social media uh, platforms, Instagram, Twitter, we'll we'll reshare those those covers because some of them are really freaking knockout, man. Yeah, I love those. They've been such a great surprise, really, in the last week. Like that's all happened very fast, which is awesome. Yeah. The other thing is just thanks for listening and and, and watching, subscribing, uh, giving us this feedback. I love talking comics. Right. Uh, so this has been very fun but it wouldn't work without people watching, without people responding. So thank you for that. Uh, this has been a really exciting couple of months and hopefully just the beginning. And with the, uh, with the wizard shows, uh, we're, we're, talking about, uh, we're talking about the days of yore. And with this, with this show, we could talk about things that are on our mind at this very moment. We are working, functioning cartoonists with big careers going on. And we can um, kind of kind of give uh, checkpoints as to where we're at with our current projects. Um, we could use this space to talk about some of the things that keep us in our drawing chairs day in day out, so that we can keep, you know, on our on schedule, keep making work. Uh, I work in the teens of hours almost every day, and I'm like an inspiration junkie. Like I need I need to be juiced up every day um, and you know I, I could consume a lot of audio while uh, doing comics let's let's hit on a couple of those what have you heard this week that's good uh, what did I hear like doesn't have to be good I guess what no, have you listened to this week anything noteworthy I try to make it good um, I've been into you know I once again man I've fallen victim to Facebook targeted advertising because in my feed um, there are all always these ads for the master class uh, whatever, I don't know what company puts it together. These, these things just came out of nowhere. And I got to tell you, I'm very addicted to them. Um, I have about 27 pages of X-Men to go. After that, it's time to write and draw my next thing. So I'm really focusing a lot on writing-related stuff. And there are a few great writing-related uh, master classes. Uh, the one that I've I've listened re-listened to two. Um, Aaron Sorkin, which is... Uh, that's that's a masterclass I've I've gone through before, but the one that I just got this week, I sent you a copy, um, was David Mamet, famous playwright, screenwriter. Um, the cool thing about those is we get to see their philosophy, right? And I've been comparing it to to uh, like the Alan Moore book book on the pamphlet on writing comics, but I'm also comparing it to uh, I'm I'm listening to Stephen King's on writing, re-listening to that. And to just see what each of their processes are and how comparing and contrasting all of their different processes, but also like 
seeing common ground, what they all hold dear and like the things that they all share in common. To me, if four great writers share this in common, like I have to give it a, you know, like it's something that I have to internalize for my own process. Yeah, I've just started the David Mamet masterclass uh, listening to that. So I have, I'm, I don't know, three or four episodes in sessions. I'm not sure what the term is. Uh, so I have a lot more to listen to, but one of the things that stands out is he talks about answering questions. So he's working on a character and it's, what does this character want? Why does he want it? What's stopping him from getting it? What happens if he doesn't get it? What happens if he does get it? Um, all things that make total sense. Most of the writing stuff that I've come across, uh, you know, cause same deal. I'm trying to learn how to write better. Mm. Um, I, I agree with all of it. It feels like you pick and choose the parts whenever you get stuck. It's like, these are just sort of tools that you could apply. You know, it's hard to argue with any of those questions, but they're all sort of designed to just build that character. An interesting contrast that Stephen King, Sorkin and Mamet share that is divorced from out what Alan Moore does, at least the 1985 Alan Moore who right. wrote that paper. Um, Alan Moore stressed getting to know your character, writing a biography, all of that kind of thing. And these other writers, all three of them, say that, listen, your character is as old as the paper it's printed, he's printed on. Like, he's the age that you say he is when you first start writing him or, or, or whatever. Like, uh, the danger that you run into if you come up with this big uh, biography of the character is like, okay, you just decided that this character really likes peanut butter. So that's now in your mind, and you're going to look for a place to <laughs> inject a situation where he's enjoying peanut butter rather than staying the course for you know what you're trying to accomplish with your narrative. One of the things that they all share in common, across the board, fuck plot. Fuck it. Like, tell a good story, you know, create a good situation, create good characters, and let them live. You know, like have some general idea of what you want to happen, but each of these writers is very happy to not know what's going to happen at the end of the story. The idea being, if they don't know, you, the reader, won't know. Yeah, I think that's a left brain, right brain method. Uh, I always confuse which, which brain side goes with that creative versus a more analytical approach. I, I dated a neuroscientist for a while and she said that's all bullshit. Okay. <laughs> well, it's, it's, even if it's not accurate science, right, conceptually, I feel like people are those thinkers. They fit into those two categories often. I write frequently with Brian yes. Maruka, yes. my writing partner for almost 20 years now, and he is very creative in what you're describing. You know, he's often sort of laying down track as we're going along. I, on the other hand, want to have the whole big picture and then edit. So the last master class that I listened to was Steve Martin's on comedy. I haven't seen that one. I have that one ready to go. Would you recommend it? It's good. I like Steve Martin. Mm -hmm. I might recommend Born Standing Up, his autobiography. There's a lot of overlap. The master class is, is much more technical. So he actually, you know, they workshop with students sometimes. So he'll get students and go through their comedy bits and actually like kind of dissect them and break them down and suggest edits or talk about, you know, this is your strong point, maybe put it here or there. But he talks about editing quite a bit. And so like, that's a step I really enjoy. And all of your writing in a lot of ways, for me, or it, that's your raw ingredients. And then it's like, you have all of this. So whenever Alan Moore is like, flesh out your character, write the backstory, maybe he likes peanut butter and you have three scenes of him eating peanut butter sandwiches, it's all great. And it, and it doesn't really matter if that is not part of the finished story because you're gonna edit extensively. Right, I, I, uh, I think that the Alan Moore approach with coming up with the big character biography and stuff is probably not a bad way to go for somebody starting out, you know, to like try to have a good idea. All of this stuff, we, we got into it today a little bit talking about drafts. We were looking at thumbnails. And, yeah, that's and looking... gonna, yeah, that's gonna be the Wizard uh, 15 episode coming this out in like great. five weeks. This is the Mr. Show, <laughs> uh, live call-in show from last week. Uh, but what we were talking about is how like each of those drafts changes. And I think that what you're describing with Alan Moore's characters, even with David Mamet asking questions, all of these approaches is just like getting to know this material. You know, generating draft and then editing that or doing the next draft, it's the same deal. It's just like getting to know the story. When I started making comics, one thing that stood out to me was I would finish the stories and it was like, at that point, I suddenly knew it all. 
Like that's when I needed to sit down and do the story. And what you need to do as that creator is like figure out how do you get access to that information early enough that you can apply it to making the story the best it can be. And I think it's just generating those drafts. It's having that big wealth of material. Like I know these characters really well. One thing that's been fun in Street Angel is as we've expanded the character, the, the cast to include some of her friends, knowing how they are, as the story goes along, it's almost like you can check in and be like, I'm, I have four or five characters that I'm following. What's this character doing? Like anytime I'm stuck on a scene, I can kind of generate ideas by just going, what's Belle doing? You know, what, what's this person doing? And once you have those characters developed to the extent that you know them a little bit, you know what they like, what they do, how they react, it's very easy to kind of like just shift around the room. You right. know, what's this character doing when this is happening? What's this character doing? And it's, you never run out of material. You know, you may have to decide like, okay, that's great, but I can't have four pages of her doing her thing but at least you know what's going on. And if you get stuck in one point, it's easy to kind of move around. It's easy to reframe that imagery. I always thought one of the things I think Grant Morrison's really good at doing is taking something that we all are familiar with, you know, a golden age or a silver age trope mm -hmm. and showing it in a different way. And then once you see it that way, it's almost like, uh, like, like I think geniuses do this where once they, their idea is made public, everybody's like, why didn't I think of that? Sure, yeah. Those are always the best ideas. Like if it's, if it's so obvious when the thing comes out that everybody asks that question, you, you know you've got gold. Like doing Wizard Magazine episodes where you're going through uh, each one Very individually. Very true. But I think all of, these, all of these writing practices, uh, you'll see stuff like about um, diets, all these different diets that come and go and stuff. I listen, all I do is listen to podcasts and things too, like you, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're sitting at your, you're inking and coloring and like you can listen to stuff. So the, the wisdom is basically all of these methods work. You just have to pick one and do it. Right. And I think with writing, it's the same deal. It's like all of these methods, all the writers we've named have had successful careers, have created original, interesting work using different methods va with different values, they're just tools. Like all, all of them will work. So you can, you know, if you get stuck in one method, if you get tired of working one way, it's like, yeah, go watch David Mamet and listen to him. Another resource for him is his WTF episode. Oh, I'll it's check that good. out. I'll check that out. Because you know, uh, Mamet, Aaron Sorkin, they're also playwrights. So their, their scripts are very conversational, very dialogue driven uh, words carry you through mm -hmm. these projects. So I've, you know, I, this week for the first time ever, I watched uh, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Oh, loved wow. it, yeah. loved it. I, I watched uh, Aaron Sorkin's uh, The American President, loved it. In fact, I also watched, I've been binging on uh, Aaron Sorkin's um, Sports Night. You ever hear of this show? It was I have late, heard of it, yeah, 90s. yeah. I never saw it, though. I heard it was good. Really, it's, it's really incredible. Like it still has the, you know, it's episodic in, in the way that old TV is kind of episodic, but there, it doesn't, almost no episode like wraps up in a bun in the way like a cliche sitcom. Like it, it's really smart. And I think that if I keep, because I'm a West Wing fan too, mm -hmm. and, and the next program that I'm gonna, gonna check out will be the, um, then, oh, Studio 60. I'm gonna yeah. check that out. Um, but I'm identifying some kind of formula where there are like three or four subplots that like tie up, but I, I feel like they might do them in a certain order. In, in each episode, like he has like a formula to how he doles them out, like in conjunction with like commercial breaks and all that stuff. I just want to s identify Everybody, that. you know, Dan Klaus especially talks about structure in television. Like television's always been built on that structure. Mm -hmm. And it is for the commercial breaks. It is like, there's, it's totally rigid. So I think you're right. You know, you start watching any of these series, you're gonna see that structure really show itself. If you're working at 32 pages at a clip, like, it would behoove one to have a kind of a structure. The, I assume manga would be the same deal. I, I wonder, because, because manga feels um, like there's such little time to fuck off that it's just momentum. Like, it's just like, get this yeah, thing done and then, right. and, then, and then cut it off because next week you have 20 more pages that you have to draw. So I feel like that might be a different beast. Um, yeah. Even the compositions on mo a lot of manga pages, especially weekly like shonen comics, it's not even composed so well. It, it's but it's it's all there, but it's not. They're not fussing. Yeah. You know I, how many pages can you do in a week? Because I I'm good for this last issue of X Men I'm working on. Um, 
I think I said I have like 27 pages to go. So so it's like the home stretch. 210 or 11 down, 27 to go. Uh, lately, I've been good for about four pages a week. Wow. Pencil ink, color, letter. When you started, you were doing about two? Just two. Yeah. Yeah. Reps, man. You do get, you doing do get into shape. Yeah. There's a lot of decision making that happens in the beginning that you don't have to reinvent the wheel as you go along. So it does speed up muscle memory. You sort of get into that, that mold. So uh, I'm, I'm doing Plain Janes right now. Um, it's a young adult graphic novel series that I had done a couple of years ago, 10 years ago. It's been a while, man. At DC Comics, uh, the rights reverted back to us. Little Brown is now publishing a new edition plus a, a new graphic novel's worth of material. So it'll be like this one big 500 page book, but I'm drawing like 150 page third volume that will be in there. I have about 70 pages or so to go. I've been drawing around 10 pages a week, but it's grayscale. So I do pencils, inks, grayscale, and I draw everything in spread. So essentially I'm doing a spread each day. You're working manga pace. Yeah, and I'm also, it's a smaller book. It's manga size. So, you know, the, those pages are not as the size of your X-Men pages, but it's t basically two pages a day, and it's whether I can get five days a week, six days a week. Um, one of the things I've been doing is waking up earlier and earlier to do it. Mm -hmm. The very first Jane's book that I ever did. I've been up later did, and later. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the, first, <laughs> the first Jane's book I did, I had a full-time day job, so I was you working did. 45 hours a week. And I would wake up an hour earlier before work to do my layouts because that's when I was like at my freshest and, you know, need to be most inventive. Yeah, use your good hours on that and go fuck into the day job it, and well, smack and then off. I'd be inking, you know, at the end of the, of the night. Uh, something I could do as I got tired and my brain was shutting down, I could still ink. And so uh, that's what I find myself doing now is wake up earlier and, you know, before my day really starts... Uh, before anything's coming in, before my wife's awake, <laughs> right. uh, get up and, and start right away. And I get, you know, half of my work done by eight o'clock or something. Wow. And then it takes me another like rest of the day of fooling around and doing emails and errands and exercise and whatever you do during the day. So what size get the rest of it done? What size is the artwork? Uh, I'm drawing on nine by 12 paper. That, uh, I went to um, the National Book Festival last year and I was a guest, uh, thanks to SPX, I was uh, brought out there um, along with uh, Tilly Walden and she is like one of the most prolific cartoonists out there right now. I got to spend a lot of time with her and just see her process and how she works. Working constantly because she turns out books, like yeah. complete books every six, eight months it seems, one a year for certainly. And she works at that small, probably the exact scale of the 9 by 12. That's something I'm interested in. Yeah, I used to cut all of my paper by hand. Mm -hmm. I would buy big sheets of paper too, and then yeah. cut it down. And uh, the 9 by 12s, I just get them in bristle yeah. pads. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, what, uh, listen, anything besides master classes? Stephen King's on writing. And I'm also, uh, I'm also preparing for the April release of the last season of Game of Thrones. So I'm uh, re-listening to all the Song of Ice and Fire books, man, which I fucking love so much, man. Wow, that's yeah. awesome. Just uh, like the thing about like the past bunch of comics that I've been doing, the X-Men thing, the hip-hop thing, the just world-building exercises. The hip-hop thing was like world-building on rails because I have real history that I have to act as the backbone. The X-Men, so like that's like, that's my master's degree. I'm in grad school now and I can have a little bit more fun. Wolverine is not going to sue me if I have if I change the scenario a little bit. There will be cornball fans out there who are like, <laughs> Cyclops did not do that. Fuck you, I say. <laughs> Suck it. Uh, <laughs> but um, this is a little less on rails for me, but that's what the exercise is. Exercise in world building and juggling things around. And that is probably one of the greatest modern examples. Another good modern example really is Harry Potter. Yeah. Um, I just don't like the way they end. Like. Harry Potter is a perfectly reasonable, like, beautiful work of fiction until, like, the very end where everybody's like, yay, Harry! And, and like, everything is tied up in, like, a very, like, you know, wussy way. And it's like, oh, yeah, this is, like, a little kid thing. I've never read Harry Potter or watched any of the movies. I could, I could, uh, I could recommend it. I, I, I I've only it's, read the first two, it's but, been and, on but my they, both, list. they both end the same way. I'm Natalie like, oh, Harry, uh, loves it, so it's, it's kind of always on my list, but I just haven't had a chance to get to it. The world building, I think, is an underappreciated aspect of comics. Everything that I said about like the Mamet, Sorkin, Stephen King approach, 
George R. R. Martin must be on the Alan Moore side of the fence because the amount of structure in this world that he's developed, he, it's like almost has to be like a one for one ratio of like material that we get to see and material he puts together on his own to just like make the world make sense. That that seems right with science fiction, big. So it's to, know, like he, think Tolkien, like right. like like Tolkien is probably you know he has a very rich world and he's developed like language that these people speak and shit like that. And yeah, that's probably where Martin is like leaning to, man. Well, I mean, he has a history in in that world. Yeah, uh, you know, a very long history in that world. So I think that's probably natural that you would think that way. You know, if you're really creating work and participating in science fiction, fan culture. All of these things, like that world building, is it's it's vital. Let me ask you this, man. Um, you said you're working on playing Jane's. It's been a couple months since Street Angel. What is what's up with uh, what's up with that? Like anything to speak of right now? Is there a Street Angel impending? Um, yeah, I just turned in some stuff for new Street Angel, but I'm not ready to talk about it yet. I, I it's have a weekly some stuff show. I have to go through. Uh, it's a weekly show. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So like, we'll we'll keep a praise, man. I have twenty seven pages of X Men to go. Of about play, seventy, play. about seven weeks of Janes to draw. Awesome, man. So we're gonna count these clocks down each week, man, and then we'll do some kind of victory dance. That's man. true. Maybe we'll finish pop, up pop some nearly the same uh, same time, I think. So, do you listen to podcasts? Uh, very very few right now. Very few. I do listen to like whenever J Jim Cornette is going on a rant. <laughs> um, whenever, whenever, when isn't Jim Cornette going on a rant? <laughs> whenever, uh, whenever Joe Rogan gets somebody interesting mm -hmm. in the studio, like that, like Elon Musk, or um, there are a couple other ones. I like Bill Burr. You know, when Bill Burr's in the in the studio, like I'll, I'll check that out. I just listened you? to a podcast with Bill Burr on it. It's Conan O'Brien needs friends or makes friends or is looking for friends. It's he, a new he, Conan O'Brien podcast. Is and, his show on no longer? Or no, it's still on. Shit? It's I've been very interested because I, I end up binging whatever it is I find. Mm -hmm. So I've, I listened to like six episodes, and there's probably only nine or ten total. But uh, Will Ferrell's been on it. Adam Sandler, Bill Burr. It sounds incredible. Uh, Mark Maron. Yeah, it's been good. And as I listen to them, I keep thinking, like, he has a late-night TV show. He's done very well for himself. Why is he doing a podcast? And it's very interesting to think of, like, why is he doing a podcast? And he tells this story about, um, I can't remember if it was Roger. I'm going to say it's Roger Waters. I may be wrong on the guest. But they did their interview on his late-night show, mm -hmm. and they cut the break or whatever. And Roger Waters is like, is this it? And he's like, yeah, that, that, was, that was the interview. And it's like 12 minutes or yeah. 9 minutes or something short. But listening to him kind of work through it, especially when Mark Maron was on, but everybody kind of talks about it. You know, podcasting is still a new enough thing that I think people don't totally wrap their head around what it is or why it is or how it works. So you get like Will Ferrell on Conan O'Brien's podcast. Right. And it's bizarre. And so they talk about it, but it makes me think like, okay, what is this? And it's, it's interesting to think of that medium that like we were doing podcasts, you know, years ago whenever it was nobody cared and nobody was interested in looking at it. But now you see people that could be doing anything they want. And they are, you know, TV show, touring, you know, huge empire of media that, that Conan is contributing to and chooses to do a podcast. Why? And so it's very interesting to me to see somebody like him choosing to explore this kind of new format. As and it's a chance to talk to an interesting person for an hour instead of like nine minutes between selling whatever shit's on the commercial. Exactly. He's selling plenty of stuff on the podcast too, of course. But it's a different format, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, like, listen, man, like, when Elon Musk was on that Joe Rogan show, he was on it for almost four hours, I think, where they're just riffing. Like, where else are you going to get a chance to uh, to get a little bit of insight into Elon Musk for, like, four four hours? Yeah, Conan had Pete Holmes on, who does a podcast. Everybody does a He's podcast. He's a porn star, right? I, I heard of him. <laughs> <laughs> it's his little brother, actually. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he was, uh, but he was talking about how his podcast always runs long. It's always a couple hours and it, nothing good comes out in the first hour. And that's part of like, you know, Joe Rogan gets Elon Musk to sit down. Not very many people talk to Elon Musk for over an hour. No, nobody talks to him at all, probably, let alone hour three is a different conversation. Especially you know? when I put some weed in him. <laughs> he like, he like lost market share and shit like after that show because like uh, the stodgy investors were feeling weird about like seeing their CEO. Smoking weed on a, on a podcast, man. 
I heard another podcast this week, and I, I think you would enjoy it. It's called Astonishing Legends. I listen to a lot of different uh, storytelling podcasts, comedy podcasts, whatever, behind mm -hmm. the scenes. Astonishing Legends is kind of like half conspiracy, half urban legends, half history. You know, So they'll take whatever topic, and, and they'll just investigate, and sometimes it's multi-part. They go pretty in-depth with it. And uh, the one that I heard this week is called The Betts Sphere. So this is a... It was discovered in Florida in the uh, 70s. There was a kind of a brush fire and this family that lived near the fire after the fire was out was driving around their property to make sure things were under control, see what damage was done. And they find this shiny metal sphere. And so the kid's like, what is this I'm taking at home? And it's about eight inches, 22 pounds, stainless steel. And they get it home, you know, imagine a shiny bowling ball. And uh, some weeks pass and the kid starts playing guitar and the thing starts rolling around. Oh, fuck. So now they have it, like, the Navy investigates it, the Marines investigate it. It's this whole big story, and it's a multi-part episode. So basically, there's a lot of questions left at the end of the episode, and it's a new show, so I have to wait till next week to find out how it works out. But the family was very grounded. It wasn't like, you there's, know, we're trying to make a dime. Season. Right, exactly. Like, they were very accomplished. So they were trying to kind of, like, manage it. There was a lot of media coverage because it's bizarre. Like, they would put it on a table, and it would roll around the table but not roll off of the table. You're scaring the crap out of me, It's man. bizarre. It's weird. You know, there, there's, like, something clearly is inside of it. They can't quite figure it out. There's no obvious mark on it. Nobody has come forward and claimed it, including various military branches. And then, like, the family that's involved with it kind of has disappeared. So the show was trying to find them as they were doing research. They're usually very heavily researched. These are sort of like history nerds. And they, they reveal at the end of this first part that they track down the son. So I guess he's going to be interviewed in the next, you know, I think the concluding episode. And I'm kind of psyched for it. But it's one of those just inexplicable phenomena that's kind of fun to hear about. I'm going to have you send me a link to that. And I guess maybe something that we could do if, if it occurs to us, like when this posts and goes live, go into the YouTube feed and maybe add a link to stuff. Yeah. Like, I'll do that too. Can I say one more thing about Elon Musk after oh, yes. the Joe Rogan thing? Yes. I listened to his audiobook. Uh, the It was a, an authorized biography. And um, the reader, when he's uh, quoting Elon Musk, it really sounds like Dr. Manhattan. It's almost it's it's almost like he's doing it on purpose, man. <laughs> like like I will try to make more t more time in my day to date and <laughs> like wow. to date women. <laughs> like you know shit like that. It's like very like monotone. It, it, hey man, he was really interesting in that Joe Rogan episode and and it was for some of those reasons. Uh you know, clearly that's a mind that is much more active than the Almost anybody. He said he felt that he was crazy for his entire youth, basically. Like, he said he was afraid when he was, like, six. Like, as he came to realize that his mind worked differently than everybody else's, he was afraid of being locked up. <laughs> uh, can't shut it off. You know, I think a lot of creative people can probably relate to that. That's a thing that Conan talks about with several of his guests. Because, like, they just work all the time. Right. Adam Sandler, that's the guest that he talks to about that. Where it's like... You just can't take time off. You try. You, you know, you say, hey, I, I work all the time. I'm going to take this break. But two days into that break, man. <laughs> I don't know about you, man, but this shit is fun to me. You know? And it's like, we always have that, like, thought exercise of, like, what would you be doing if you hit the lottery? I would still be just doing this shit. And I've worked comics into a habit in a way where it's like, I wouldn't know what to do otherwise. Like... This is just what I feel like doing. You know what I mean? Like, uh, I don't have to work 10 hours a day, 15 hours a day, but what else am I going to do with my time, man? My big struggle is it's, it's balance. You uh -huh. know, like there's so much I want to do. And if you accumulate too many of those things, you know, I end up, I think, doing more freelance than you do. Yeah. And it can overextend. And that's the tough part. It's not, you know, like I like all of this stuff mm -hmm. and I have a list of things I'd like to be doing as well. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, there's, it's not a matter of like, man, I need to be done and, and take the break. It's more of like, I'm excited to get onto this project. That's like seven projects down the road. Uh, good problems to have, I suppose. But the balance thing is a, is a weird thing. Jeff Bezos, I, I saw a fireside chat with him talking about uh, like all of, all of the endeavors he has going on and, and he you know, a big part of like management is 
cognitive framing of like thinking a certain way. And he calls his situation, he calls it, uh, he calls it um, work life harmony. Like yes. meaning like, you know, if, yeah, know if the family it. thing is, is if you're happy, you could be happy at work, whatever. And, and like, I just like that semantic fucking way of say, thinking about it for, um, for my situation, because it's like balance to me feels like a, it almost like feels forced. You know, where it's like, okay, I must, I must now do this. And just, if you're happy, at the end of the day, right. if you feel good, the way I think about this, man, it's like we're, we have this new endeavor with this YouTube channel. We have, we have healthy careers in, in illustration and making comics. And once again, Elon, if he can fucking run Tesla and run... Boring. Solar City. And yeah, the Boring Company. And uh, what the fuck is the other biggest? SpaceX. I think that I could maintain a YouTube channel <laughs> and draw some fucking comics. Like, it's not that big of a deal. Yeah, that's, that, you do make it sound manageable. <laughs> Speaking of comics, yes. what comics crossed your path this week? Have you bought any comics? What's the last comic you bought? So I'm putting myself on a, on a very rigid deadline. Like, uh, Marvel has been very good to me throughout this entire process, and they've been working at my pace. You know, they... I check in regularly and then we adjust the release dates accordingly. That said, um, I've been working on this for three years. You know, it'll be three years in like March. Um, it's time. It's time, to, it's time to, to put this baby to bed. And all of my extra energy, everything that's not going to this is going to uh, the X-Men comic. Long way of me saying I'm not hitting a comic store for a little while. Now, the last comics that I got, the last one that was... Uh, really has been interesting to me is just watching Rich Tomasso do his thing on the Dick Tracy comic with uh, Mike Allred. Love the art, man. Uh, when when he, he let me know at Heroes Con that he was going to be working on this thing. And before that, David Hedgecock from IDW, he was like, Ed, I don't mean to tease you, man, but I think you're, because I guess he knew that I was a Dick Tracy mark, you know, like, yeah, right. like sometimes there are shots from my studio and you can see every Dick Tracy book. Um, He's like, I'm not going to tell you who it is, man, but just send me an email when we make the announcement. And it was Rich, and I'm like, oh, that's cool. But I did make Rich to mass, so I pulled out a Sharpie, and I pulled out a scrap piece of scrap paper. And I'm like, draw me Dick Tracy right now, man. <laughs> he made me a little nervous right there. He looked a little shaky, but I think he did a good job. I think, I think the comic looks really nice. Um, and the other thing that I've been grabbing, but I'm waiting to read it until they're all doled out, is uh, New League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Um, it's hard to find on the fucking racks, man, because they design, they design it, um, in different ways. Like, I think yeah. one of the last issues looked like, uh, the old Eagle Dan Dare comics, um, that preceded 2000 AD and all those. And I go to Wayne at the comic shop. Hey man, I want to get the new, uh, I, I keep almost saying 2000 AD. I want to get the new league. And he's like, oh, it's right there. And I'm like, looking where? And he's like, right here. And I'm like, holy fuck, like, this one's called Mina, this one's called whatever it's called to look like the Dan Dare. I, not, I don't think that that's a great thing to do, like, right. like, like to design it in all those crazy ways, man. I, I was thinking about this a lot, actually, and, and I do know that you, you employ this, so don't think that I'm, like, saying, like, any passive-aggressive kind of thing, but, like, I think that, like, a series, if you design every book kind of different, I think that it, as a whole, like, can, not like hurt the, I don't think that it helps. I think that the only people that impresses is other cartoonists and shit like that. And like to just have that same logo just makes it more identifiable. Like especially say you get a body of work and you see a space like this on a bookshelf with like boom, 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 boom. Like that'll catch the eye. You right. know what I'm saying? And, and like that just made me think about that. You know, the fact that I just wanted to process a simple request at the comic shop and like I'm... The comic is in front of my face, and I'm like, yeah, where'd you say it was? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. The cool thing about Street Angels is pink. Like, get the pink book. Yeah. Although they're not all pink now. Is that so, so? even that's fallen off. <laughs> yeah, I guess so, huh? You know, I intentionally designed those to look different because I don't want them to be viewed as a series. Yes. I, I mean, by all means, buy them all. If you like one, buy, the, buy another one. Yeah. But I do want them to be viewed as like, hey, I see one. It caught my eye. Good. Buy that one. Completely yeah. self-contained. Read in any order. So a little bit of that standalone design is is reflective of 
not a series, even though there are several of them and they're all by me, so they look the same. Do you have to address questions from, from uh, the audience? Are they like, which one's the first one? Uh, because we're sort of conditioned with the series mentality as comic book readers. You yeah, know? absolutely. So like, uh, do you find issues come up with Yeah, um, for sure, absolutely. You know, like it shows anywhere I'm set up, they'll catch somebody's eye, they start looking, and it is, where do I start? And it's not a good answer, start anywhere. Like, mm -hmm. that's not a good answer. I think I would sell more if it was like, start here. <laughs> you know, what are you gonna do? Like, there's always some trade-offs and I like, this was very deliberate, mm -hmm. let's put it that way. Maybe it's not the right answer or maybe the next thing I do will be done differently, but this is how I wanted to do this and I'm thrilled with how it, you know, the end result of them, so. One of the things that I absolutely adore about this medium is the constant education that uh, that that it brings me in terms of just craft and business stuff, man. You know, no matter what happens, it is a learning experience, man. Like I'm not quitting anytime soon, no matter what happens. You know what I'm saying? But like, you do a you do a thing a certain way. Did you get the results you wanted? If not, where did it go sideways? And then you adjust accordingly, move forward, man. It's really cool, man. And it, it's it's down to things like even just. Uh, Designing end papers, you know, it's it's constant. It's a constant educational experience to me, man. And I hope it stays that way forever. Yes. You look surprised when I said I saw Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross for the first time, man. Is that something that you've uh, held dear or, or saw a million times? Or do you have any other David Mamet flicks that I should check out like right away? He did a movie. He wrote and directed a movie called State and Maine. Mm -hmm. It's very small. I'm trying to think of who's in it. His, his, I think it's his wife, Rebecca Tall, maybe, is her name. Uh, I find her really compelling in it. Alec Baldwin's in it. Is that right? No, I'm freaking out. No. Alec Baldwin's in Glenn Gary. Doubting Glenn Ross. myself. I can't remember the whole cast. It, you know, it's an ensemble cast. It's set in this small New England town. Basically, these Hollywood producers show up there. William H. Macy's in it. They show up there to shoot a movie. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a character in it that's kind of like a Tom Cruise type who gets in trouble with local, with the locals. Um, I like it a lot, but I can't exactly tell you why. It's sort of the interplay of both small town, there's some theater ideas, and there's Hollywood. And they're all happening in this quaint location where everybody has, and, and politics are mixed in. Like the, lo you know, the filmmakers need the local, uh, politicians to kind of sign off, give them permits, enable them to shoot there. The Hollywood production, of course, is over budget, behind, everything that you would hear, you know, for Hollywood production. So you have like all of these conflicting forces that think of themselves as the most important, uh, all in this small town. Kayfavor's out there. What, uh, what David Mamet flicks should I check out, uh, you know, ASAP, and for that matter, um, Aaron Sorkin stuff as well. I'm, I'm, I'm going through all the TV shows, but I know he's done several flicks. You know, you know what I like about the TV shows? Um, you know, I watched first couple seasons of West Wing. The sports night thing is cool. I imagine the newsroom, which I think that's called, was his HBO show is called The Newsroom. Yeah, that sounds right. Um, that was cited by Tarantino as like one of his favorite shows. Um, what I love about the stuff that I've seen so far is... Um, it's like science fiction to me. And it's, it's, he's, painting, he's painting a picture of a universe where everybody has a type A personality, cares a lot about their job, and works hard. And like, I love that because I see no evidence of that in the real fucking world whatsoever. No jobs I've ever had did I see anybody give a fuck yeah, in any major way, man. And like, you know, in this comic book thing, like you and I, we have this channel that we're working on together and I've seen you and your process extensively for 15 years, man. You're a hardworking motherfucker, man. I consider myself to be a hardworking motherfucker. Everybody I know is that type A energy. So it's almost like I get to, I get to just indulge in that. Like when I was talking about like inspiration junkie, even though it's a work of fiction, just like seeing these people who really care about their job, it, uh, it makes me feel comfortable or something like that. I was gonna say less lonely, lonely, but that would be super pathetic. It's such a cliche that you hate your job. You know, a person hates their job. Yeah. People hate school and then you grow up and get a job and you hate your job and whatever. Imagine going through life that way. Like I always think like life is really short. Sure. And that would just be, I, what is that? 
I can't, I can't imagine living that way. But I know a lot of people that have no real like thing that they want to do. If they won the lottery, I guess they'd watch TV or something. I don't know. And I used to think like, no, that's impossible. Everybody has something that they care about, that they're passionate about, that they want to spend time doing. Not true. No. It's, uh, it was very alarm. I was an adult by the time I realized that, you know, I mean, I, I guess I wasn't observing the adults in my life to recognize it. Cause you know, certainly I knew a lot of them that the job was the job. It was a necessary means to an end. And I think that, you know, maybe in some of their cases, their thing was their family and yeah. the job was this enabling part of their life that they didn't care about that much. Right. You know, like they did it in order to facilitate this other thing that they maybe didn't describe or think of as like, that's my passion. It's almost you take for granted, like right. you're a good provider. Clearly you love your family. You're willing, you know, you're doing this job that isn't stimulating, isn't rewarding. You don't like whatever you hate your boss, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But they, I don't know that they even would couch it that way. Like, yeah, but look, my family eats and they have a roof over their head and they're good and you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, that's probably most common. I, I bet. I, bet I may also be projecting, and they might not care about their families either. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you know something? I I really am like trying to find the time to do because I am putting so much energy into this uh, into the the X Men comic, the Miyazaki documentary about like like Studio Ghibli and all that. It's in Japanese, man. So that means I have to actually watch it. Right. I have to sit down and watch it with these Aaron Sorkin things, dialogue driven. You could get the gist. And still draw comics, but man, I want to revisit this Miyazaki thing too, man. I recommend it to you too, and if you guys haven't seen it, I forget, it's called something about dreams and something or other. I forget the exact title, but uh, it's, I've seen it once. It's really incredible, but, you know, that flick, you know, the Tezuka documentary, Man Ben, these are all things that I love, and I'm, I identify myself with, with like, manga because I spend, I might not produce the page volume that a Japanese cartoonist does, but I work the fucking hours, man. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's another reason why I got these shades on, man. I don't want you to see my bloodshot <laughs> fucking tired yeah, eyes. Yeah, I probably have that happening now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, man, you have classic features, man. Like, uh, we will be having the, uh, this Christmas, we'll be having the Jim Rug Fireman uh, calendar for all the ladies <laughs> out there, man. Put them in the yellow fucking suspenders, man, with the hard hat and shit. <laughs> We need to make That'd some money great. for this That'd channel. That'd be great, yeah. <laughs> That's what we'll do. It'll be a fun shoot. It'll be like the swimsuit issue when, when they started producing videos. We got, we got like 15 minutes, man. Um, yeah, I have a couple things. Yes. Okay, one, uh, stuff I've done lately. Yes. I put up a new t-shirt this week. Yeah, where can people find it? Um, Shop.spreadshirt.com slash Jim Ruggart. Put something I'll put a link in, in, the, in, the, in the bottom. But I, I like the t-shirt stuff, so I've been trying to do more of those. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, that was something that I did this week. Also, um, I get a lot of feedback from, from the channel, from the kayfabers about like, hey, your show made me, you know, dig out this comic or I get pictures of packages that people are ordering comics, yeah, which is, yeah, I can relate to that. Totally. But here's what I want to say to everybody. Have you read those comics that you ordered? Like read more comics. You know, I think a lot, I hear a lot of horror stories about comic shops that are struggling. You know, the direct market's been unhealthy virtually as long as I've been reading comics. But you do hear these stories, you know, like I heard a couple of people talk about their shops that were that were closing up for different reasons. One, somebody was moving, so it you know, wasn't a bad thing. But nevertheless, read these comics, you know, read a comic. Uh, I feel like that's, that's gonna be my new mission statement slash motto is just read a comic. Tell me about the comic that you got excited about that we talked about that you read. That's what I wanna hear. Not just buy, but read one of those comics because I've been reading more comics, mostly for the show. Mm -hmm. And uh, I look at so many comics, but when I actually sit down and read them, it is a rewarding experience. Like it, it, it can be that nostalgia that looking through an old wizard, you know, kind of like gets, gets the neurons firing dust off the old pathways. But reading them can do that same thing. So read more comics, read a comic, get it from your library, but, but read one. Like they're, they're fun to look at, they're really fun to read. So read a comic. Yeah, that's good, man. We should close out every episode saying that. But before we go, man, you're going to France next week. Like, like I'm gonna, I'm gonna be here alone. I'm gonna try to get Shioli. I'm gonna try. Hey, Tom, let's let's do this next week, man. But you're not gonna be here next week. You're going to the Angoulême Comic Festival. First off, have you been there before? No, first you time. <laughs> oh yeah, I guess I guess so, like when you went to Denmark, that was your first major time abroad, right? Yes. Oh, okay. You know what? It, it was Tom who went to Angoulême before. 
Yes. Awesome. So do you have any plans, like signings? You should let people know. Yeah, I'll be signing in, I think, the New York tent island. I'm not sure the terminology at the At House uh, books table. Um, I don't have a schedule. You know, like I'll probably be there a lot. No, no panels or? <laughs> no, no panels like or that? anything. So I'll be signing. You can find me at At House books. And uh, mostly it's a new experience for me. So like I'm kind of psyched to just go and see what it's all about. There's some exhibitions that I'm excited for. Ones that I know about are like Richard Corbin has one. Uh, Milo Minara has one. Um, so, you know, I'm going to take in as much as I can, hopefully find some books that I didn't even know existed and look at lots of great art. It's, it's, it's pretty incredible out there, man. When, when I was there, I was there two years ago, there was, um, help me out, man. Um, there was an ex exhibition of the mangaka who did, um, Lady Snowblood. I'm not going to be able to help. But you that's that. the comic, yeah, right? Yeah, okay. Right. The mangaka who did that, there was also... Uh, an exhibition of a lot of Will Eisner stuff. And I've seen a lot of Will Eisner stuff before, but the presentation was far cooler because there were even um, sculpture involved in this thing, man. People like sculpting these like little in installations that had dynamite and, you know, timers and shit like that. But in route to the uh, the building, the museum or whatever it was that warehoused the, the Eisner exhibit, you have to walk past the giant Corto Maltese statue that's there on the walkway and before you get there if you go a certain path there's a giant Hergé head statue in like bronze and this shit lets you know you're in comic book town baby <laughs> sweet yeah like you're in comic book town there's a lot to check out like it's like exhibitions by day by night i'm going to see mark Baudet do like a performance of like the cheech wizard and the lizard characters like all that kind of shit all comics all the time and it's all important people like right like you know otomo was there a couple years back you know what i'm saying man yeah i'm i'm, I'm pretty pretty psyched for it well you uh you're you're heading out soon so you're going to be in paris i imagine for a little while yes there's a street with all the comic shops that's the way their stores <laughs> work man paris I, it's kind of cool but but uh it's also very weird because not only is there the shop where there's like the um comic shops like there's this side, there's a street where it's like manga shops. You know oh, what I'm saying? Man? I was I was like, hoping to find a good manga shop there. And you'll find five in a row. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah, I'm, and, I'm excited. And all their stuff seems to work that way. You want pizza? Go on a street where there's 20 pizzerias. Good. I like pizza too. The one downside, the one thing that really freaked me out is um. There are like police and and, and guards and shit like walking around the streets of Paris. And, you know, they're, they're teenage boys or whatever, and, and they'll walk with these guns, and that tip of that gun will be on you. Like, they won't go like this, but they're just walking, and you're going to be like, ah, oh, because that gun fucking muzzle is pointed at you and shit. And I don't know about you, but I'm, like, scared to, like, because they're just walking around kind of, like, looking at shit. And it's like, you know, they're boys, you know? And it's like, that gun just pointed at me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that wow. freaked the shit out of me. It happened that a lot of times. Doesn't uh, I don't like that Cause part. Because they, they just walk down the street like this. They don't like do like, hmm. I mean, pro they're probably supposed to, but maybe they just relax a little bit. But I've had this, I've seen the abyss of that circle of the gun muzzle, like pointed at me way more than once while I was on the streets of Paris, man. Wow, that's unsettling. Yeah. Not to freak you out, but it did fucking. Yeah, nobody's freak. told me about that part. <laughs> Let me see if I have anything. I had some notes, so let's see if there's yeah. anything that we... Yeah, we'll wrap this up, man. We got a couple minutes. There's no comedy in uh, conspiracy culture. Those dudes are super serious. I believe it. Like, I've I've, uh, I've listened to Art Bell, you know, yeah, like, like yeah. Coast to Coast a couple of times, man. And, uh, yeah, you can't, even, you can't even really question them with, with, like, any hint of, like, a smile in your voice. Yeah, I assume that they've been ridiculed a lot, so maybe that's the reason. But I think if you showed up there with some comedy, with some humor, uh, you, you could you could develop a following. <laughs> showed, showed up where? At the, at the conspiracy theory gathering? Yeah, wherever that's. <laughs> the conspiracy <laughs> convention. I always liked on Coast to Coast whenever um, people would call in and, and, you know, that's where we established that, like, the gray aliens are the ones that are, like, the presidents and, like, the politicians are the grays and stuff. So, like, that person would call in and, like, establish that. And then, like, a month later, somebody will call in and be like, 
Yes, my local mayor is also a gray. So, so like they're building on top of that narrative. <laughs> right, right. You know what I'm saying, man? That's that's what made me think of it. Is like it is it is funny. Like it feels like a Christopher Guest bit. Half <laughs> half these people that come on these various shows. So that that's one. And Jim says this conspiracy theorists because he's clearly in the Illuminati. <laughs> <laughs> You got something else or should we wrap this up, Jimmy? I'd say that's good. Cool, that's it, man. So we'll be back next week. Jim is going to be in France. Go get your comic signed. Do you have French editions of Street Angel? I do, yes. What, do you know how uh, how to pronounce? Street, is it called Street Angel or is it like... Yeah, it just says Street Angel. Oh, that's whack, man. You need to... <laughs> like, one of my favorite things with foreign It'd editions... It'd probably be a terrible translation. Like, I bet it would make no sense. Like, <laughs> like do-gooder on <laughs> homeless do-gooder or something. <laughs> I, I love to task uh, foreign publishers with um, retooling the logo and, and, and shit like that. You know what I'm saying, man? My favorite is the Japanese version of Hip Hop Family Tree, especially the yellow and the red. It reminds me of Street Fighter 2 logo. We're going to cut out this week. What did we decide the show is going to be called? Jim and Ed Weekly Shoot. Kayfabe Weekly Shoot. Something Weekly Shoot. Yeah. and But not next week, at least not for me. Yeah. He's going to be in France, man. All right. We're out. So here's the problem with everything. It starts out, we're all completists. We all start with the first episode of everything, podcast, video, pilot episodes, whatever. Rarely are those things good indicators of like, this is why this is successful. This is why you know what this is. Like usually it takes a while to find your footing, but inevitably the number one in the series is the one that gets the most eyeballs and it's <laughs> the worst. It's the most unformed you know, the rawest, the one that you haven't figured out the formula yet. No exception here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, man, our last episode of Kayfabe, the wizard stuff, it's far better than the first. It's just natural. What are we going to do? Do a bunch of them in silence and then uh, put out our 15th one as the first? Yeah. We should number them out of order. <laughs> this will be like... <laughs> uh, Weekly shoot number 17. <laughs> the thing that, that I will say, uh, just going off of what you said at sort of the top of the show, uh, you know, thanks to the Kayfabers out there for, for continuing uh, patronage of, of the channel. And uh, one of the things that I'm most appreciative of with the Kayfabers is they're very gracious for um, giving us some latitude, knowing that we're not professional broadcasters, but we are, you know, we're getting better. We're getting better at this. Yeah, the other thing that, that they're good at is answering questions. Like That's whenever for sure, we're talking man. about something, it's like, what was that? Or where did this appear? Or do you know if this is online? We've gotten a lot of information that way. Absolutely. So that's kind of great. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, hopefully, the, something we'll continue to be able to do is like sharing this stuff. The David Mamet question, right? Right. Uh, maybe that'll be the, in, in the comments or in the resources is, is links to further stuff like that. So that's been kind of nice. Absolutely. Absolutely. I encourage you guys to check out the comment section in uh, previous videos because people have expanded upon some of the things we said. They answered some questions we had. Um, they have their own personal stories about this person or that person. It, this little community that's starting to crop up here, man, is really becoming a valuable resource uh, to me. So I have to imagine that it's becoming a valuable resource to others, too. I mean, that's sort of the point of, like, putting this thing together, man. If there was a playlist of Palmer's Picks where people were going through Palmer's Picks and talking about their favorites, then I wouldn't have, we wouldn't have to make it. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Anyhow, we're signing off for real this time. My name's Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. Our information is going to be in the description below. Follow us on... St everywhere. Follow us everywhere. <laughs> and, or nowhere. Uh, right. Without uh, any more filibustering, we're splitting for today. Good night. But before we go, there is one thing I want to see. Does this create like a uh, some sort of uh, infinite kind of uh, <laughs> thing? Man, this is our little remote. How's that look? I don't know. I guess I'll have to see you on video. Yeah, I'm excited to find out. Infinity and beyond. All right, we're out. Read more comics. <laughs>